So uh, welcome, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us today for the uh, breakout session, A Few Good Men. Uh, my name's Elena Janat, and I'm Vice President of External Relations at NCCS. I'm here to introduce the session and then turn it over to our capable moderators, Randy Broad, Woody Brokenberg, and Brad Glassell. Uh, we really hope that this will be a conversation between everyone here, but first I want to give a little bit of context as to why we need this session. Um, we advocate on behalf of all people touched by cancer, yet our advocates are overwhelmingly female. Less than 20% of our CPAP members are male. And I think those numbers are actually much less than 20%. That number comes from um, the attendees at our in-person symposium last year, where about 19% were male. Um, yesterday in a breakout session, we shared the results of our survivorship survey. We had two different samples included. One was a national um, sample, which is representative of the entire cancer population of the United States, and then an additional sample, which was those who are connected to NCCS. In the national sample, it was 49% male because that's what the um, cancer population is in the United States, and of the NCCS con connected sample, so that's people who came to the survey through either our direct outreach or outreach from one of our people like you who, who follows us, um, the amount was only 16% male. So only 16% of, of those folks were, um, were male, and it, the, it skewed the results. Um, and you can see that if you, weren't on yesterday, you can go back and watch the on-demand survey um, results uh, that were um, in a breakout session yesterday. So we really wanna make sure that our advocacy efforts reflect the needs and perspectives of all the survivors we represent. And so we wanna make sure that we are involving more men in advocacy. We have some incredible men who are involved as CPAP members and Elevate ambassadors like Randy, Woody, and Brad, but we wanna to continue to do better and we really need your help and guidance to figure out how to do this um, and to ensure that we are representing the needs of men with cancer. Uh, I spoke a little bit before we went live and was telling uh, you know, Randy, Woody, and Brad that I'm a little nervous I'm gonna say something. It's as a female, sometimes it's weird to say uh, with all that females have done to try to get their voices heard to say, hey, we need men, <laughs> but I know we do and we, at NCCS, it's so important for us that our work represents the, the true makeup of the cancer population in our country. So this is really vital work. And I look forward to this session. I've been really excited about it. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Randy, Woody, and Brad to share their experiences in advocacy and to pose some questions for discussion. Um, please keep your uh, things on mute. If you are not talking, you can keep your camera up and we encourage participation. So um, feel free to ask questions and you can unmute yourself. Uh, we'll ask some questions that we want to uh, engage you with during the session. So with that, I, I think um, Woody drew the short straw. So you're going first and uh, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Elena. Um, I guess they say the first time is the most painful, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm Woody Brokenberg, and I'm a childhood cancer survivor of osteosarcoma. Um, what what's, was really interesting about my story is that um, I was diagnosed with cancer in the 60s. And, um, you know, we, we knew really nothing about cancer. So it was really shocking um, when um, it was discovered that, that I had bone cancer. Um, one of the, the other crazy things is that the, um, the prescript, there was not, not many um, treatments at that time because we didn't know a lot about cancer. So it was just about, they said, well, we'll amputate your leg. We'll have to, we'll do it really high. And that perhaps will give you the better chance of survival. And it turned out that they were correct. Um, I grew up in a, a small town in Florida and I um, am one of 10 children. Um, so at the time that I had cancer, it was in segregated Florida. We had um, what was called a colored ward, um, which uh, in the basement of the hospital. So I'm just, you know, that makes me even more grateful that I was able to, to come through this experience. Um, how did I become involved in advocacy? 
it sort of started with um, my sister who's a, um, a certified tumor registrar and she about 20 years ago said that you should really become involved with um, a cancer organization and I think my resistance was that you know having survived cancer I really didn't want to talk about it you know I just because you always kind of have that fear that if you talk about it, then, you know, something's going to happen. So I, I overcame that fear and I started volunteering with the American Cancer Society first um, when we started up Relay for Life uh, in Southern California in Thousand Oaks. I chaired the first two relay events and then I became um, the project lead for Relay for Life for the state of California and was on the um, the nation's um, um, team initiative as well. And one of the, the interesting things that came out of that is I was always interested in research, particularly because I didn't see a lot of the funds that we were raising that was going to address disparities. And so I figure, you know, if, if I'm there, if I'm able to learn, if I'm able to make an impact on the peer review committees, um, then that's where I want it to be. So eventually I started with peer review and then um, was elevated to the council, which approves um, the research budgets. Um, at the time I was there a few years ago, we were letting about $250 million in, in research grants. Um, so really, I guess that inspires me to, um, to be an advocate is to because I, I want to make a, a difference. Um, you know, one of the, the expressions in my family was, you know, be the change that you want to see and to always to um, want to improve life for, for myself and then for other people. Um, and how does advocacy um, benefit me? It, um, it, 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 you know, I, there's a saying that when you give that, it, it, it sort of um, activates endorphins in you. So, it, it, and, and that's a rippling effect. So it also affects the, 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 the changes or the people that you meet that you're making a difference. But it's like when you, you toss a um, pebble into a pond, it makes a ripple and it goes on um, in infinity. So you never know the things that you're doing, you know, what the outcomes are going to ripple um, throughout life. And that's my story, and I'm sticking with it. Thank you so much, Woody, for, for sharing that. Um, I think we said, Randy, you're next. I reside in the great Northwest. I, 12 years ago, March, I was going to bed like just about any other night, but I had a nagging cough, and I woke up the next morning coughing blood. And within a week's time, I was diagnosed with stage three non-small cell lung cancer, which was deemed inoperable at the time. And I was given a year to live by the, I guess you would call him the prescribing surgeon who deemed me inoperable during, while I was on the table. Um, so needless to say, that prognosis changed a few things in my world. I was running a small business. I had two teenage kids and uh, my value system completely switched in a matter of about five seconds. So I went from building wealth and doing all those things of going through life that we thought we were supposed to do to propping my kids to the very top of the chart. Um, it was an interesting time and I did not know very much about cancer. No, there were very few people in my family that had ever been diagnosed with cancer. I did not know, I mean, I was very low risk according to them. So again, I didn't know anybody that had ever been diagnosed with lung cancer. Um, it came out of nowhere and um, I was deemed I had a bad gene. So going through this process of trying to understand the disease and the treatment, I was in treatment for over a year. Um, and uh, at the end of that, I, Again, having been given a very short prognosis, I, I wrote a book um, because I wanted to leave something for my kids, you know, about my values and about things that I had learned in my life that maybe I hadn't shared as, as explicitly as I needed to. 
So I wrote a book called It's an Extraordinary Life, Don't Miss It, and I figured that it would be at least something they could put on their coffee table and refer to if their dad wasn't around to guide them through certain things. And that book opened up a few things. It opened up some speaking opportunities, and one of them was with an advocacy group in Washington, D.C. called Longevity, and they are specifically an advocacy group around lung cancer. Again, I did not even know that a cancer advocacy groups existed other than maybe Susan G. Komen at the time. Um, I really had never given it too much thought. And one of their key individuals there, Katie Brown, reached out to me and she said, um, I read your book and I'm wondering if you would be interested in doing a keynote at our annual Hope Summit. So I did. I went out and um, I remember very distinctly this moment in time, I shared my story about having fired my first oncology team because I didn't like what I was hearing. And during the intermission, um, I would say half of the room, and these were all lung cancer patients or caregivers, came up to me and said, it never ever dawned on me that you could fire your oncology team. Well, needless to say, that was a eye-opening experience. And one that really prompted me to get on stage, if you will, for lack of a better way, and guide people and assist them in getting through their disease. So since that time, it's now been 12 years, I, um, I've kind of become a cancer lightning rod. Anybody that knows me, it doesn't matter what kind of cancer, if they know anybody um, that gets diagnosed or has been diagnosed and is going through any kind of challenging aspect of their treatment, I get a phone call, an email, a text, and asked if I will support, which I have never, ever, ever said no. Um, I get extreme satisfaction, if you will, if I can make a difference in helping somebody through this process. Because I remember so distinctly myself not knowing where to go, not knowing what to do, not knowing what questions to ask. Um, you know, it's not like there's a Yelp for thoracic oncologists um, to find these people. And Dr. Google is Dr. Google. I mean, there's a lot of information out there, but a lot of it's erroneous. And so um, you really have to wade through this. And so finding somebody, and unfortunately at the time, 12 years ago, very few people ever lived five years, let alone um, 10 or 12. And so, um, but that number, those numbers are really increasing. I'm living proof. And so anyway, I've, I've just gotten a tremendous amount of of satisfaction out of being able to do this. And like Woody just shared, it's kind of like, I mean, I personally, I feel obligated, if you will, for lack of a better word. I mean, I, I've been given this opportunity and I'm not supposed to keep it to myself. Um, I'm here to share and whatever can. And if I make, if it helps one person, that's all that matters. If it makes, if it helps one person, then it's been completely worthwhile. And I'm grateful for a lot of things, but I'm very grateful when I can help. And I, I can honestly say I've been able, I've been told by several people that I have assisted that it's made a big difference. So for that reason alone, I think it's really important. And for that, I'm gonna pass it on now to Brad. Hello. Hi, my name's Brad Glassell. I live in uh, West Dallas, Wisconsin, which is uh, by Milwaukee. Hockey. And um, I was diagnosed with stage three prostate cancer in 2016. As a matter of fact, it was on St. Patrick's Day that I was uh, diagnosed. <clears throat> so some people do what's called a cancerversary. And uh, it just happens to be a big party every day, every year for mine. So it's nice that all these people come out for my anniversary. Uh, I was diagnosed, like I say, with uh, prostate cancer and went through treatment for about a year and probably about three quarters of the way into that. I, I think like in one of the discussions of today is a, a lot of men, you just put your head down and you, you do the fight and you don't look around. And um, I happened to run across by accident something on a, a work website about 
a organization called Epic Experience that does camps in Colorado for cancer survivors and signed up and went to that. And it was um, a light bulb went off in my head that I'm not the only one out there and that I don't have to be the only one out there and that there's a cancer community out there. And uh, so after that, I started to get involved and volunteer. I volunteered for a number of organizations. And one of the things that I did find is, and this is not a negative, but organizations don't share together all of their outcomes and what they do and everything that way. And, and a lot of times it's because of the fact that they have to fundraise, they have to, you know, do things like that. And especially these kind of self-help organizations or helping ones. And so um, I had been looking around for kind of my mission and, and what I would do with all of this besides just individual um, volunteering and ran across NCCS and, and the CPAP team and looked at that and I said, and, and I've been involved in, I like politics, I like news keeping informed and I thought that looks great. Well then soon after that they put out the um, advocacy uh, team um, Elevate Ambassadors and I, I put in an application for that and I was accepted. Some people say it's because I was the only man who uh, applied for it. I don't think that's true. I think that's not true at all. But uh, so I was accepted that and came to Washington, D.C. And uh, it was really fantastic. And it was a great uh, opportunity to go through. And through that, I started an organization, a nonprofit called Brad's List, which the concept behind that is to promote these different organizations where people can get involved in cancer community. So NCCS, which I'm also involved in the CPAP team, is more legislature, which is extremely important and, and I wanna be involved in that. That's more on the order of not medical, but what do you get involved in these organizations and, and be part of this community? And uh, so uh, I have started that and it's, it's a nonprofit, but it's self-funded, so it uh, does not compete with other organizations. And uh, <clears throat> so, that I do, again, continue with these other efforts. And what I get out of it, it's kind of an interesting thing because when you do volunteer efforts, you know, you get thanked a lot of times. People say, thank you for doing that. And I kind of look at it and I'm like, well, thank you for letting me do it. You know, it's, I, I'm not, you know, exactly sure how you quantify that, but um, uh, you, you, kind of on the side get this whole thing out of it that um you know it, it's just something special and and again uh you get involved in a community that understands you and you understand each other's and and that's sometimes pretty hard to find in this world a real understanding of what everybody's going through and so i find that extremely rewarding so uh i've plan on continuing advocacy in, in a number of different ways. And um, I think it's a great thing and, and everybody should find what they can do with that. So as Woody said, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Thank you so much. I, you know, one thing I'm thinking as I'm listening to the three of your stories is that, um, Brad, you were a little more of an anomaly because you sought out this connection yourself, but for Woody and Randy, both of you were brought to this at the suggestion or the request of someone else, someone either Woody, your sister, who obviously probably close and has influence over you and, and you know, and then Randy through someone at an organization that due to your diagnosis probably, you know, would mean a lot to you or you would imagine might mean a lot to you, but yet also through a professional angle of your book and wanting to be a keynote. So I think these are, you know, a good way to, to kick off that conversation. We have a question here from Loretta, who um, is another one of our Elevate Ambassadors, and uh, she's been advocating for survivors for over 20 years. And she said it's very difficult for her to get men involved in work. Loretta, I don't know if you want to unmute yourself and, and come on camera and talk a little bit about your experience. And, and she's looking to you guys for for help. I know she knows a lot of people in her community. There you are. Go ahead, Loretta. Yes, uh, the question comes up because I meet a lot of uh, male cancer survivors 
and um, we do these presentations every quarter. And as we do them, they are so excited and they get involved at the moment, but it kind of fades away. <laughs> and so we've been having this barrier, this, this uh, challenge, I should say, of how do you keep the men on board and interested in their own health? And, um, and I have two boys, so I'm having that same struggle on another level with them. So uh, if you have any tips that you all can share, and I'd like for each of you to kind of address that for me. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll tell a little story that I think might be along those lines. As I mentioned earlier that I attended this camp in Colorado, and, and so cancer survivors get together for that. And I've mentioned that to some male friends of mine who have gone through cancer and said, you should go do it. It's really great. And they're all kind of, yeah, no, that's all right. I'm okay. You know, I'm, I'm all right. And they have the same uh, issue where it's low male participation. So recently, one of the friends who went through cancer uh, diagnosis and treatment, I said, you know, you should go. And he said, no, I'm all right. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, they have a real problem with male participation. And so you don't get that male viewpoint in there. They're not getting that help in there. It would really help them if you would do that to help the organization. Oh, okay, well, I'll do that. So instead of making it about them, make it about the organization, your help, because I think men are fixers. You know, um, the relationship thing. Okay, women, you know, I've heard this before, like if your wife comes to you or you come to them and say, hey, I got this problem, something's going on, you know, with my friend, the man wants to fix it, you don't want them to fix it. You just want them to sympathize with you. I mean, that's that Venus Mars thing. So I think if you, that's one approach is to present it as how you fix this. So. Yeah, I also think that, um, you know, people like to, to feel safe. And if you could foster um, an atmosphere of safety, that sort of keeps the person involved. And also, you know, I think, Sometimes you, you need specificity as to, you know, a project. And men, I, I know sometimes I'm really more project oriented. So if you give me a project, then I could fix, you know, I, could, I can have a, a beginning, middle, and an end. And then I feel a sense of accomplishment for that. So um, it's, it's just sort of appealing to, um, you know, I know sometimes it, we get really very busy. So if we could like segment things um, that way, I, I, I think that would foster more participation from, from men. Very good recommendations. And the only thing that I feel I could add here is, <clears throat> you know, it's like a business proposition. What's in it for them? Um, I hate to say it that way, but you got to somehow come at it from a standpoint of saying, if you get involved in this, you will benefit from this perspective in some shape, manner, or form. Um, so I'm going to use NCCS as an example. I've been involved with CPAT for, I think, six, seven years now. And the very first time that I participated, I got to meet Elena, I got to meet Shelly, um, Lindsay, and the rest of this. But I'm telling you, Fabulous people, wonderful experience. Um, gotten to know them quite well, very professional, and always can count on them for you know being a, putting together a quality program and getting something from it. So I would just you know again with your own organization in some shape, manner, or form, come at it from that perspective. And then obviously it doesn't hurt if you've got a lot of really wonderful women. Most guys really do like that. So um, you know. Might want to come at it from that perspective. Um, I just wanted to add that I think sometimes, you know, one of the good things to do is to acknowledge a person's participation. You know, always thank that person and let them know what a valuable contribution that they made. So, you know, kind of a, it, it, to feel appreciated um, will help to help those people to return. I love that. I think that's great advice. What do you think of that, Loretta? Does that, uh, does that give you some ideas? Maybe, you know, just even the, I like the point about the specificity um, of, you know, I know I hear that a lot. Like, don't just say, 
oh, I'll help you in any way that I can be specific about what you need. And, and uh, have you tried that yet? And, and what do you think? Yeah, I think that's great. Uh, you gave me some great tips. Uh, the part about men being fixers, you know, you kind of know these things, but don't, you don't really think about them. And, 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 and then I think one of you mentioned maybe giving them a project to do, and we haven't taken that approach. So you have given me something to really think about, and we're going to try these and see how that works. Okay. But thank you so much. Yeah, I think it, along those lines too, even to the best specific, I'm figuring that word, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Uh, of saying, okay, I need help with this. And here are three times. Yeah. From one, even if it doesn't matter to you and yeah. what it is, put it out there to say, I could use help on a Saturday from three to four to do this or whatever. I, I want, it would be interesting to see if more sign up for it. Thank you. Yeah, we'll try that. Thank you. Well, Loretta, you have to report back and let us know. Um, I will. <laughs> these things work because I think, you know, one of our um, goals of this conversation too is to come up with some concrete ways that NCCS as an organization mm -hmm. can reach out to more men and get more men engaged um, in the work that we're doing. We did have a question from Suzanne who said she's and Suzanne, you can feel free to hop on and, uh, and speak if you'd like. Um, but she found a young researcher this year and I guess has talked to him a lot uh, through conferences and lectures um, about health disparities. And is this the type of men we are looking to bring into CPAC? Absolutely. I mean, just people who, um, certainly researchers who are engaged in this work, um, we don't discriminate, so we want physicians, researchers, survivors, we want everybody um, to, to take part in this. But um, I think we are definitely looking, uh, looking for more men, so. Okay, um, that's good. I actually was, uh, I was one of the Alamo advocates at um, San Antonio this past, and one of the requirements is that we have to find a poster and we have to write about it, and so, I don't know if you've ever been to these, but there's like thousands of posters and mm -hmm. they put up like a couple hundred at a time and you, in two hours, you try to get through everything. Well, I was looking at this one and I, I've, I've been on the DOD BRCP um, grant reading before. And so I, I'm very much into the science of cancer. I've been doing this for 21 years. So I, I really know quite a bit about it, even though I look like a mild mannered redheaded girl. And, um, so I walked up to this one poster and I read it and I thought, oh, I've never heard of anyone doing this before. And I was reading it and I said, this is very interesting and it's, it's working out and everything. So I turned around and I said, who, who is this poster? And this young African-American man came up and I said, how did you think this up? He was doing CDK seven and it's always four and six. Anyway, he, it's working out really well. He's writing it up and he's getting ready for his, uh, to defend his, um, his defense for his PhD. And I was asking him, I said, uh, he goes to Case Western in Cleveland. I said, what's, what's it like? Cause I'm from the Detroit area. And of course COVID has brought out the elephant in the room that there is a huge health disparity. And I, uh, I said, um, what, what do you plan on doing with this? Um, do you plan on staying with breast cancer? And he said, I'm really interested in, you know, helping people with disparities. Cause I told him and I said, well, the group that I'm representing is National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship, and I learned about it when I went to Miraval and met Shelley, and I've been involved with a lot of other, in 20 years, because I was very young when I was diagnosed, I've been involved with a lot of groups, and um, I really like the message, and I, I like the demeanor that Shelley has, and I found that everyone who works with her has the same thing, and I, I told this young man about it. I said, would you be interested, this group, what we do with is we lobby, but we lobby about um, science and things. I said, we really need, I told them about the young um, doctors, the medical oh, yeah. students that we have. Mm -hmm. And I said, it was so amazing. And he said, oh, I'd love to get involved in that. So every time I get anything, I send it to him and I say, you need to do this. You need to meet these people like Otis Brawley and all these wonderful people who, who are also African-American, who are minorities. I, would, I hate that word, but that's how we describe it they're considered minorities. And so I try to get him on every single one of these calls and I'm, I'm trying to get him to lobby um, with us. I don't know if he will, but I said I'd go on the phone with him, but I, I just, 
I felt very strongly that he, this is what he wanted to do. So I sent, I, I called Shelly and I told him, told her all about him. And she said, Oh my God, yes, we really would like this. So um, I know a lot of guys that are cancer survivors, but I wouldn't say that they want to be active, but they use me as a sounding board. If they meet somebody else, can you help this person? You know, I'm kind of like that too. Um, but I, I thought it was really good to get this young man who's just starting out in his career that he can get involved and meet all these other people that are working on health disparities and equity for their careers to get another person in. So, I mean, I can do the same thing next year. <laughs> well, so the question is, Suzanne, um, has this man actually come to any of these things or has he attended any of these? Yeah, yeah he does. He I, okay. I, yeah. I was going to say, if no, I was going to punch it yeah. to the guys to no, say, he has. Okay. I don't know if he's here today, but I know he was on yesterday. Oh, um, great. Good. Well, so I mean, I'm think... trying to get him to lobby because I said, I'll go on the phone with you or whatever, you know, for his first right. time. But it's, well, it's not a type of thing. Be If we could get more people that are just coming into it, that can be in it for the long haul and, you know, sure. learn from the cancer people. And then from their perspective, I'm a researcher, what, why they research and what they're looking at seeing real people. I mean, usually I know a lot of researchers because I just walk up and talk to them, but um, I'm not afraid of them. They're just a person like me. Not as cute, but what can I say? Um, <laughs> so I just you turn your camera on. <laughs> yeah, I know. We can't see you. Susan. I know. This, it doesn't it work on this. It doesn't work on this. I don't know. I pressed a button once and now, you know, I can see you, but you can't see me. Yeah. Okay. Well, but, if you hover over down the bottom, if you want to change that, hover over down the bottom and there's a video uh, button yeah, just, to, it just, to the left. But, it just doesn't work on this computer. Oh, I see. Gotcha. I pressed something once upon a time, and now I got to figure out how to undo it. But um, <laughs> I mean, I I know a lot of different researcher people. So should I be asking them to? I mean, we we would love for them to be involved too. I think that you know that's always great to have people in research engaged in what we're doing, and again, men to be engaged. But our problem is really more with the male cancer survivor. Our, okay. I should rephrase that. Our opportunity is really more with the male cancer survivor um, and or even caregivers, you know, someone who wants to share experiences, talk about their experience. They don't have to physically talk about it, but, but it would be great if this time next year when we sent out our survivorship survey, we could say, 16% in 2020 were men. And this year, you know, we have a goal. Maybe it's even oh, okay. making up like a male. I have a brother who is a, a scientist. Mm -hmm. um, he He's a PhD chemist and he creates um, active ingredients for pharmaceuticals, but he did his um, PhD. He did on a, um, what was it called? It was a cancer drug. Um, mm -hmm. and, and like some people go into cancer or doctors because someone in their family was ill. Definitely. And so they have that experience because they were, uh, a, you know, they were a child of someone or their aunt or their mother or something. So people that have that, that kind of connection would be good, even if they're not a survivor themselves. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Can I ask, Suzanne, can I ask you something? Sure. So it sounded to me like you met this man and you kind of bugged him for a while to get involved and then he got involved what made the difference um i i've been back and forth with him because i chose his right. poster so we were back and forth he was helping me to um put it in more like layman's terms how to how to distinguish what his mechanism was. So we were back and forth on that. And I told him I was with this group and that we had this conference and that they had the doctors. And he was very interested because he said he's interested in working with um, health disparities. And I said, oh, well, I have a group for you. And um, so we just have become friends. Like I'm going to go down for his, um, when, he, when he does his defense, I'm going to go to Cleveland and stuff. So we've kind of de developed like a professional friendship, I guess you might say. And um, I mean, he, when he meets other people, it, like it was amazing. He got to see all the people at Roswell and he was like, oh my God. And then, you know, every, I go, you got to watch this one. These are the greatest people. You need to meet these people. You need to introduce yourself. And um, so he's really psyched to, to, to get into doing this as a, as a young researcher, just starting out. Um, so I think if, if I cooked him, I could probably hook some other guys too. 
Yeah, because it kind of sounds to me like it was a combination of two things. First of all, he's very interested in that area. And then secondly, you spoke of a specific connection he could make. So therefore that, like Randy said, that connection helps also. So kind of the two things, if he wants to accomplish something in this disparity, but he also has a connection that helps him in what he's accomplishing. So I think that kind of goes along that lines of how you spoke to him. Yeah, I have four brothers, so you figure it out eventually. <laughs> Well, thank you, Suzanne, for, for sharing that. Um, and if, if people have more questions, we'd love to keep them coming. I do have one that is um, about, you know, actual advocacy and Hill Days and going, you know, coming with an organization like NCCS to DC and going to the Hill. Um, again, it's a low amount of men that come and we would love to see more men. What do you guys think? What what are the barriers? You know, is it the time away from work? Is it time away from family? Um, and how can we as an organization help, you know, uh, deal with some of those? Randy? Ben, I, I mean, look, it's one of the best experiences that I've had working with advocacy groups. Um, I've gotten to know my delegate very, very well, Susan Dell Benning, um, my congresswoman of my district. Um, I think she, she just accepted me this last week as one of her favorite constituents. <laughs> and um, I was honored. I was, it was really great. And I, when I was there last year for CPAT, um, I was meeting with one of her staff members on the, that runs the healthcare. And she was supposedly going to be out of the office. And so I wasn't going to be able to see her, but I walked into her office and I was met with this, um, her staff member, and as I was leaving, she came walking in the door. And she goes, hi, Randy, I didn't know you were coming here. And I hadn't seen her in a year. I didn't know she even knew my name, let alone what I, whatever. And, um, you know, I can't put an emphasis on that enough, that how great that is, because I just think she's walks on water. And I'm very supportive of all the things that she does. And I've now got this kind of a relationship would have never had that had it not been for NCCS. Um, they made the introduction. In fact, I think Elena, you and I saw her for the very first time. You accompanied me to that meeting. And I remember so, that. Yeah. Yes. You impressed. And, um, I remember that. Yes. So, um, you know, that to me is it's a it's a it's a great thing to be able to have that relationship with somebody. Again, when these healthcare issues come up, I can reach out to she and her staff and say, hey, have you, are you, wh where do you stand on this position? Yep. And, um, you know, or so, have you, you know, here's where, here's where us as cancer patients are thinking about this, would like to share this because this is important to us. So, so to have that kind of connection and that kind of um, outreach is huge. And um, I'm very, very grateful for it. And then not to mention, uh, two years ago, I got asked, uh, to come up and speak in front of Congress with by Nancy Pelosi. And again, you guys set that up. I don't know too many people to get that opportunity. So that was um, a lucky day. Mm -hmm. That was a lucky day. And well, um, I felt very, I, very fortunate. Well, I think that, first of all, thank you. And, and you're, you know, a dream to work with. Obviously, everyone here is. And um, I, but I so I think back to, okay, you took the leap to come to CPAT, right? I'm not totally sure what made you take that leap, but once you were here, the benefits were coming back to what you guys all were saying, what I'm hearing is this kind of what's in it for me. And I don't mean that in a bad way, but I mean that in, you know, what am I seeing that is coming back to me as positives from this experience? And so for you, Randy, you got, you know, to speak. I mean, yeah, no one gets to speak at a, Pelosi conference, that was a shock to all of us. And you're close with your member of Congress. So is it putting together testimonials from guys like you to almost recruit other guys? I'd love to get, you know, Woody, you haven't joined us on a Hill Day. I, I don't know if you've ever done any of that work or, you know, what you think about that. Is that just kind of like- I think that would be excellent. I mean, I yeah. really do. I think, mean, you know, get some personal men's testimonials as to what their value is of working with CPAT 
or with NCCS. And um, I don't, I can't see that that would hurt at all. Um, again, I would just say that I, you know, getting back to your very first question there, I just, I didn't know who, I didn't know NCCS from a bar of soap when I first came out there. And so I just remember, I don't even remember what the connection was. Somebody reached out to me and says, you know, you should go check this out. Um, and then I just remember reading and thinking, okay, um, you guys are really focused on legislation. And all the other advocacy groups that I had worked with, very few were. And so I was very curious. So it was that curiosity aspect, I guess, that, you know, um, cured the cat and um, got me to um, take the leap. And it's been great ever since. So great. you're having a hard time getting rid of me. <laughs> we don't want to get rid of you. I, I see that Virgie's lighting up. Virgie, are you trying to say something? I am, Elena. How are you? I'm great, Virgie. It's good to hear your voice. Good to hear you all. Um, I think that one of the barriers is um, getting men to know about NCCS. And I think one approach might be, and I know we attend a lot of the other uh, associations like the AACR and Stupid Cancer and other associations, is to make a pitch to men on outreach when we are at these other organizations, uh, kind of a recruitment in a sense, you know, not mm -hmm. just too bold and open, but in a sense to reach out to men to, uh, I, I guess like Randy said, I think it was Randy that, uh, or you were saying put together testimonies and then display them or have some way of getting them across to other men. Because one of the key things is to get them to know about you. Mm -hmm. And once they, if you can get them to know about you to come, then I think oftentimes they will find a point of interest. And the way that I found out about uh, National Coalition of Cancer Survivors were at the Stupid Cancer Conference. Mm -hmm. I attended that and I attended the CPAT breakout and so forth. So uh, that was the way I found out. So it's just getting knowledge out there that we are here and that we are open. We uh, need men's testimonies and blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, oh, Woody, I think you're lighting yeah, up I, over there. Go ahead. Okay, I, I just wanted to say that I think that you have a lot of low hanging fruit Okay, you, you got us three guys. So if you were to just spotlight, you know, our stories on your website or, you know, send uh, a press release that, you know, that I was elected as a elevated ambassador or, you know, letting people know what's in their communities. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's one way. But my, my advocacy experience has been like um, the American Cancer Society did Celebration on the Hill. I did meet with Diane Feinstein and then um, locally in Sacramento. But one of the things that we do here is to engage our, our local um, political community um, to come to events. So we're, we're kind of like always on them at, to, to come and, and speak as to what their support is on our cancer um, initiatives. Great. Thank you, Woody. Mm -hmm. that's, that's definitely helpful. I think too that one of the things is that Generally for men, you know, they're going through treatment, they, they, you know, have cancer and such. And most of the times all they're going to hear about is um, therapy sessions, support groups and such. And I think they have a tendency to think that is all that is about, that everything is about their health, their therapy, and they reject that and don't want to do that. They don't want to open up, they want to tell their feelings. So I think framing NCCS more in that you helping, you helping the organization, helping men's health or something like that, not about them, but about what they can provide for it would do a long way too. Uh, I think once they get involved in it, they probably are gonna be helping themselves, but <laughs> you gotta backdoor it that way where they can't come into it, say it's not about helping me, it's about helping others. Great. Elena, I just wanted to, to say that um, NCS, NC, CS I know it's a tough one. Has, 
there, there, there's so many resources. I have just been so impressed with just the quality of the information that that is disseminated through this group. And so, it will just be my pleasure, um, and I'm sure the the other men agree to to sort of you know broadcast this from the rooftops, you know, because there's so much that you can learn, so so many things that can help you. Um, increase your your quality of life and to to be educated about issues as they relate to um, survivorship. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Woody. We appreciate that. And I think I like this idea of a campaign of sorts going going after men. You know, um, but but trying to uh, recruit more men to get involved in this work. Uh, Loretta, I think you had a question. Do you want to? Ask that. I saw you typed a question in here, but I'll be honest, I'm not probably going to mess that up. So if you want to ask them directly, that'd be great. <laughs> okay, I sure will. And I guess this is to either of the speakers or all of them uh, from your past experience in dealing with your cancer journey. And then just looking at the climate where we are today, how has these events like the pandemic and social injustice, has it had any impact on your cancer journey or those around you? Good question. Who wants to tackle that? Well, I mean, obviously our world is upside down right now. And um, I've been to my, I, 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 I was not feeling very well. I was having a lot of symptoms, um, quote unquote, COVID symptoms in February, March, and early April. And um, I was going into my oncologist and before you walk, I mean, at, at S, at, uh, I'm treated at SCCA, Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. You cannot walk in the door and not get tested for COVID. Every single time you go in there, you have to be tested. Now, I don't know how many of you have been tested, but getting that cotton swab stuck up your nose to tickle your ears from the inside is not exactly what I would call a good time. So um, wanting to go there is not a, was not a great thing um so that's been challenging that was uh and it's still that way right now in fact i was supposed to have a follow-up meeting with um, my pulmonologist but i'm feeling better and so i canceled because i just didn't feel like going in there and dealing with it and um you know when this maybe passes i'll 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 give it another shot but uh, or if i you know start feeling poor again um but no, it's definitely, it's a whole new realm of society and you cannot ignore it. And especially if, and I mean, again, with lung cancer, I mean, I don't want to try to, but I could almost guarantee you if I were to get COVID based upon what I'm hearing, you'd be dealing with another guy next year, not me. I mean, it's that serious. And so um, I can't hardly, you know, I, I, I'm following all the rules. I'm wearing masks. I don't get within six feet of anybody and I'm staying very isolated. So good thing I've got a good partner and, you know, life's okay that way. Well, and I'll tell you, um, along those lines, I am the last person in the world who should complain about something. And my complaint is kind of the total opposite of that. And I, I am very concerned about um, being diagnosed with COVID. I mean, because you know, my age and, and things like that don't, don't help. But it, it has cut off all volunteer opportunities. I retired last year to, to do this stuff. And it's been frustrating, you know, to not. And then I worry about all these people. I, I know a lot of people in the community who are having very serious PTSD over this stuff. And, um, you know, one of the big things I did was rides to treatment for American Cancer Society. I don't, I don't understand where these people are. Are they getting to treatment? What's going on there? You know, so it, it's kind of frustrating to me that. So again, to complain about that when people are out of work and actually sick is kind of silly, but it, it's my world, I guess. <laughs> so. Yeah, I guess I've, I've sort of been a recluse. Um, I, I go shopping once a month <laughs> for groceries so I don't have to go out. Um, but one of the one of the things I wanted to mention, when, which I forgot to say, is that um, when I lost my leg, and even when I started working um, in corporate America, it was a it was a challenge to to get a prosthesis in, in the first place. 
it mm -hmm. always hit the upper limits of my insurance policy. And so, and then they had this crazy thing that you get one limb per lifetime, right? <laughs> Wow. Even though, even though you know wow. your your body is changing and you're growing, wow. And so I did a, did a lot of advocacy working with Prosodus to get that change. But and and for maybe the last um, ten years, I've been trying to get what they call the C leg, and that's the one with the microcomputer in it. Okay. So finally, um, last year I got it. So it's changed my life. I mean, wow. because, you know, having such a, you know, high amputation, the knee is the integral part for me and walking. Mm -hmm. So now I don't have to worry about that at all. So I got to say that I'm really, that made me really happy. Wow. Very good. incredible Thank that you. you advocated for yourself to, to get that, Woody. And, you know, um, it's amazing how one of the things that always, you know, right now, it just struck me again, even though I've working cancer for like 20 years everyone's journey or whatever you want to call it trip trial is so so different and you know it just you with your amputation and your prosthetic it just kind of hit me and so i think that one of the great things that i would love for us to be able to express to more men more people i have a feeling we're going to need the women to get the men right we're going to have to take our our women to help us get the men, but is that we are encompassing of all. And you're gonna find people here that have had such different experiences. And if as a man, you don't wanna talk about your experience, you don't have to, but you know, maybe some of these more tactile ways that, um, that they can help us, uh, I think is really um, eye-opening. I wanna, we're, we're coming up to the end of the session. So I wanted to give um, our speakers a chance to just kind of, maybe give a an overview of what you think might be our best steps moving forward i'm already thinking like boy we should probably form a committee right because that's what we always do form a committee but uh you know of men and women because i think in this work i want to make sure too that we don't the, the messaging has to be just right so that you don't alienate the 84 percent of our you know constituency who are hardworking women who do a great job so um but anyways I'll, I'll turn it over to you guys and um randy you're unmuted i think so we'll start with you okay yeah um i think that's a great idea elena and i do think have a mixture of men and women um because you know Cancer is agnostic, you know, it's not, it, it doesn't look at uh, what sex you are. So I think having both perspectives would be valuable. Um, but to kind of touch upon here with what Woody was talking about, um, self-advocating, I, I mean, I had to learn to self-advocate. I didn't know any, I really didn't think about it very much at the beginning, but it's incredibly important that people self-advocate. So maybe you come at it a little bit from that perspective. And it's, again, I think that might, um, that might, that message might affect men or bra men a little bit more than it would women, just thinking out of the box. Because, you know, men tend to want to take control of things, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, but I, I can't put enough emphasis, and I always, always, always stress the importance of self-advocating to every single person, every single um, cancer patient I ever talk to, you need to self-advocate. And um, because if you don't, you, you will probably end up at the end of the line. So I would go with that one, and um, I'll leave it at there. You know, one uh, thing I have, very recently run across a few men's groups, uh, a Facebook group and, and uh, a couple of them. And a matter of fact, a couple participated in the telehealth thing. And um, I did find out, I find that they seem to be very willing. So I wonder if maybe there's a recruitment through some of those groups, if we can get permission from those groups to post things on their site saying, we're looking for something specific, help with this type of thing and getting involved in it. Uh, so that might be it. And or I, I'm not sure if NCCS of having a specific men's group there too, of a men's advocacy group would be the way to go. But uh, that that's a possibility. Great. Thanks, Brad. Woody? Okay. I, I think this is just the, um, the beginning of the conversation. 
And um, it's, it's something that we should continue. But I, I just wanted to, to close in that um, Dr. Maya Angelou is one of my favorite poets. And in her poem, On the Pulse of Morning, she writes that the horizon leans forward, offering you space to place steps of change. So let's place those steps of change. Jeez. That gave me chills. Okay, well, there's there's nothing else that can be said after that. You can't follow Maya Angelou. Um, although, so you know, because since we are a few good men, I'm thinking we need to come up with and say, in the immortal words of Colonel Jessup, "You yeah. want me on that wall. You need me on that wall." <laughs> okay, well, I I'm not even sure who Colonel Jessup is. But that no, might be from I, a few good men. The movie is that you can't handle. Yeah, the truth. I, okay. I gotta say it didn't work out that good for him, though. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, I want to thank our three good men here today: Woody, Randy, and Brad. Thank you all so much. And to those of you who were with us and asked such great questions, um, we'll definitely follow up with this. I encourage people to share this video with other men who might like to get involved in advocacy. Um, to hear these testimonials and, and we'll work on uh, our campaign to, to get more guys involved. So thank you everyone. Have a wonderful day.